All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and our BCBA task list series. Today, we're continuing with philosophical underpinnings and A5. Describe and define the dimensions of applied behavior analysis. This comes from Bear, Wolf, and Risley, 1968. Seminal piece, I think the most cited piece in ABA ever. Extremely important, still guides what we do today. So you have to know all seven dimensions. I'm going to go through each together. As always, check out behavioranalyststudy.com. Be sure to subscribe, work hard, study hard. Let us know when you pass. Let's get going. Okay, Bear Wolf Risley, 1968, recommended ABA be the following. Now, these seven items are our dimensions. And I think what gets tricky is when we start talking about assumptions and understandings of science and dimensions. We have a lot of these categories that are easy, easy, easy to mistake. Okay, so what you want to do is probably get an acronym, right? I like that cage. Okay, but you can use whatever you want. You just don't want to start mixing up the dimensions and the assumptions and all the other things that we can mix up when we're talking about these groups of terms, okay? So for example, which of the following is not a dimension of applied behavior analysis? Well, we're talking about dimensions. So it's gonna be one of our seven. We know behavioral is, we know analytic is, we know effective is. So empirical, one of our assumptions, not a dimension, okay? Very easy mistake to make. Why fluency is so, so important because when you're under stress, it's easy to make these errors, these little mistakes, okay, that can cost you. Okay, let's start breaking down each one. We're going to start with behavioral, probably the most obvious one because applied behavior analysis, everything we do deals in observable and measurable behavior. Measurable behavior. Three points are emphasized though, okay? One, behavior chosen must be in need of improvement based on observation and measurement. Now, what does that mean? That means we don't do FBAs, and we don't choose goals and behaviors for change simply based on what a parent tells us, all right? Parents have a long list of things they consider they need to improve, but you're not going to make any choice until you actually observe that thing and you measure that behavior, okay? Two, the behavior must be measurable. If that behavior isn't measurable, how do we plan to change it, right? When choosing behaviors, and it's the reason we deal in public events, public events are much more likely to be observable and measurable, measurable, reliable. Three, you must ask, whose behavior has changed? A lot of times when we begin ABA, we're looking to change the client's behavior. What ends up happening is the stakeholder's behavior actually changes. Okay, So we want to be sure the behavior we're changing is actually our clients or our learners. And why? When we talk about things like generality later on, when that client leaves their environment, if their behavior hasn't changed and only the stakeholders has, okay, it's not going to be a, it's not going to be effective elsewhere. It's not going to generalize. So again, behavior must be based on observation and measurement. Behavior must be measurable, and then we have to ask whose behavior has changed. Did we truly change our client's behavior? Question: Why would private events typically not adhere to the behavioral dimension of ABA? So what is a private event? Well, private events are thoughts. Feelings, things that happen inside the skin, they are behavior, but why don't we typically target these for change? Okay, Based on our behavioral definition, why? A, private events are not behavior. Well, we know private events are behavior. B, private events are only observable when others are around. Again, incorrect. Private events are not observable to others. C, private events cannot be reliably measured. That's what we're looking for. Since they're these internal things inside the skin, right? It can't be reliably measured, and that's going to violate this dimension of behavioral. All right, let's talk about applied. Applied means improving behaviors that are meaningful and socially valid. So once we have our behaviors, we want to make sure they're meaningful in their lives. Okay, We should enhance and improve lives. We don't just change all the behaviors just because. Okay, uh, Well, Sally's annoying. Can you make her not annoying? Right. What does that really change? How is that enhancing and improving lives? Okay, We're targeting behaviors to improve and enhance lives. Socially valid here is the key term. Okay, That is the applied and applied behavior analysis. Okay, Real life, meaningful situations. These can be social, language, academic, daily living, self-care, vocational, recreational, leisure behaviors, pretty much any domain. Now, insurance companies might think otherwise. Totally different discussion. But for the sake of what we're doing, right? on our exam and studying this content, we can we can target any domain as long as it's socially valid. And then significant change in enhancing and improving lives includes parents, peers, 
teachers, other stakeholders. We're not just focused on that client. Yes, they're the most important. Yes, they're the priority. But their behavior affects those around them as well. If we can change behavior in a way that improves the lives of others as well, well, that's just a bonus. Okay. So when we think applied, what do we think? Well, socially valid, meaningful, socially significant, and enhancing lives are all associated with what dimension of ABA. I think this one can be tricky to remember, but when you think applied, think these terms, okay? Think socially valid, think meaningful, think significant, think enhancing lives. If you think those and pair those with applied, okay, you're, you're not going to miss the applied questions. So we know it's going to be C, okay? We're going to talk about the rest, analytic, systematic, and effective, but when you think applied, think of these terms, okay? They're synonyms. They go hand in hand. All right, analytic, demonstrating a functional relation between manipulated events and targeted behaviors. A little more technical sounding, but all we're saying is that what we want to prove is that we have some control over behavior. So when we introduce our independent variable, let's say reinforcement, okay, we want that dependent variable, let's say writing, to increase, okay? So if we introduce our independent variable and writing increases, we can say, well, maybe there's a functional relation. That's analytic. Same thing if we're going to, you know, use extinction and we want to decrease the behavior. OK, if we use extinction and we want screaming to decrease. If we implement extinction, screaming decreases, there's a functional relation. That's what we mean when we say analytic. We're controlling the occurrences and non-occurrence of behavior. To the fullest extent, right? Because causality is very hard to prove. But we can say, well, we have some control over the behavior. There is a functional relationship between our intervention and the behavior. We have some control. We're really just describing how, how behavior has changed or worked in real world situations. So again, think when you think analytic, think functional relationship. Question, Greg has not done as well on his last two tests as he has hoped. This time, Greg studies three times as much as he ever has for his other test. Greg ends up getting an A on his test. What is the independent variable? So your IV is typically going to be your intervention, okay? It's what you're manipulating. Your DV, okay, is what we're measuring, the behavior, what we're changing, right? Behavior, whatever we're measuring, okay? That's typically how it's going to work. So let's start with the DV. Well, what's the behavior? Okay, well, we know Greg is... Want to score? He wants to score well on his test, and he hasn't. Okay, on this one, he gets an A on his test. So his the dependent variable, the, the test score, improved. And why? Well, thanks to the independent variable which Greg manipulated, which was studying three times as much. So the independent variable was what? Well, it was A, time studying. Test scores was a dependent variable. Okay, manipulating time studying impacted test scores. Failing his first two tests was not the dependent variable, okay? It's what led to Greg changing or manipulating his study time, which led to the change, okay, in the test scores. So failing his first two tests isn't the DV, the test scores are the DV, right? So probably the most technical of these seven dimensions, but just think, analytic, we're simply saying functional relation, okay? So you can see three of our dimensions are in the name, right? Applied. Socially valid, behavior, observable and measurable, analysis, functional relation. We can control the applied behavior. Technological. This one, uh, very simple, right? Very straightforward. Technological means we're trying to add to the technology of behavior change. And in order to do that, we need to write our procedures in a way that somebody else can replicate it. If we're just writing procedures that only we can do, you're not adding to the base of technology. It doesn't matter if only you can do that, okay? Because maybe that only works for your client because only you can do it. We're trying to expand the technology of behavior out. In order to do that, we want our interventions to be replicable by others, okay? Interventions that cannot be replicated with fidelity are not part of our technology. Ask yourself, can someone else who is trained do your procedure? So when you think technological, think replicate. I think this one's pretty straightforward. Most people understand this, okay? You want to ask yourself, can someone else who is trained do your procedure? Max is a certified accountant who is searching for his first job. 
finally gets hired to replace another accountant who was just fired. Previous accountant wrote down everything he did and how to do it. Max attempted to follow along, but did not understand anything the previous accountant wrote. This example lacks what dimension of ABA? I like framing technological questions in non-ABA terms. I think it, it hammers it home a little better. For example, if we have Max, okay, he's getting, he just got his first job, and the accountant okay, wrote down everything he did and how to do it. If it's going to be technological, if it's going to add to that technology base, well, Max should be able to do it. However, Max had no idea what the previous account was talking about. Okay, He can't follow along with his interventions. This example lacks what? Well, it could be conceptually systematic. I mean, it might follow accounting principles. Maybe it's behavioral. Okay, It's observable and measurable behavior. It could be applied. It could be meaningful. But it doesn't matter. Why? Because Max can't do it. So if Max can't replicate it, it doesn't matter how good those systems were. Nobody else can do it. Not part of our technology. So when you think technological, think replicate. Okay, conceptually systematic. Procedures for behavior change should be described using behavioral principles from which they were derived. Not as complicated as it sounds. All we're saying here is when we design procedures, when we design interventions, we have to use behavioral principles, okay? Or, or, or derivatives of behavior principles, meaning we use ABA technology, ABA methods with procedures. You're not going to go in as an ABA therapist and deliver talk therapy, okay? Unless you're a certified talk therapist, it's a different conversation. If you're just a behavior analyst, you're going to go in and you're going to use ABA behavioral principles, okay? So there are an endless number of ways to change behavior but they're virtually derived from our same principles if we're practicing ABA. This allows new procedures to be, to be created from the same principles, and conceptual systems are better than random interventions. The idea here is you can always trace your intervention back to one of these principles. So it's not you're just randomly choosing and picking and hoping. You're saying, I want to use reinforcement and extinction, okay? And then we're going to do, you know, a DRO, Okay, and you're going to create some huge intervention, all right, with these principles, reinforcement and extinction, leading to the RO, leading to this intervention. And then when somebody comes back, it's not just this random thing you put together, but it's very conceptual. You can explain it. They can understand it. Okay, so conceptually systematic think behavior principles. Now, which of the following are considered principles of behavior change? So the three primary principles, which really everything we do is derived from is reinforcement, punishment, and extinction. So D, all the above. These three items lead to all our other interventions. Think about differential reinforcement, okay? Reinforcement and extinction, right? Um, a response cost procedure, that's just punishment. A um, shaping, right? We're reinforcing approximations. All these interventions are conceptually systematic because they're based on our principles. Effective. Behavior must be improved to a practical degree. Now, this one is tricky. If you're dealing in populations, maybe severe intellectual disabilities, okay, going from zero to one could be extremely effective. If you're dealing in populations, maybe learning disabilities, going zero to one might not be as impressive. Whereas zero to 50 is a lot more impressive. So it's always case by case. It's going to be up to you, okay, and the opinion of the people who deal with the behavior each day to determine what is actually effective. What level of change do we need to see? Because that behavior needs to be changed in a way that is clinically or socially significant. If I'm teaching I don't know, math problems and at first I do one, and then six months later, they can do two. What have we really done? Has that really improved to a practical degree? No. Okay. So when thinking about effectiveness, consider how they change the client's life from a socially valid perspective. So when you think effective, think behavior change, right? And that's kind of kind of kind of difficult to wrap your head around. But when we think effective, we're only going to say it's effective if that behavior change has changed to a significant degree and impacted their life. And this is when things start to get a little convoluted, okay? Effective, 
generality, applied. How are these how are these things different? Okay. When we think about applied, we're we're talking about the behavior itself, right? We're talking about that socially valid behavior. When we think about effective, we're saying we need to change that socially valid behavior, okay, to a practical degree. And then when we talk about generality, then we're going to talk about, well, they need to generalize that behavior in another location. Okay. Generality and effective go hand in hand, but at the same time, they don't. We'll talk about that. So you teach social skills to three children for six months. They become very good at interacting with each other, but they still cannot make any friends outside of your training program. Would this be considered effective? What do you think? If they're interacting with each, with each other, but they're not making friends outside of your training program, who cares, right? Now, why isn't this a lack of generality? Well, maybe it is, okay? But we're talking about effective, right? Is it effective? Yes, you change the behavior. We're not just looking for behavior change. Anybody can change behavior to a non-significant degree. We need real change. B, no, the child should have made multiple friends at school by now to be effective. Nobody's saying that, okay? It's a practical degree. C, no, the change has not been effective outside of your training program. This is what we would say. If they can't make any friends, what's the point of these social skills? Nobody wants to hang out with them. They don't need 100 friends. What about going from zero to one. They've gone zero to zero. That is not very effective at all. So would this be considered effective? No. And then finally, generality, arguably the most important dimension. And why is that? Well, because generality encompasses maintenance and generalization. If behavior doesn't maintain, okay, what's the point? Because we can't keep teaching behavior forever. Eventually, we have to stop and teach something else. But when we stop and teach something else, we can't have that behavior just go away. Second, we're teaching usually in this controlled environment, right? Maybe a school, maybe a clinic, maybe a home. If we teach in the home, what good is it if it's not going to school and clinic? We need that behavior to go from home to clinic to school, and they all encompass, okay? So it's behavior that lasts over time, exists in the non teaching environment. This is maintenance, okay? And or spreads to other behaviors that are not directly taught, things like stimulus and response generalization. So behavior that maintains is generality. Behaviors that change are not the focus of the intervention. That's like stimulus, gen, right? And response, gen, okay? And the behaviors occur outside of the learning environment. Arguably the most important dimension. If you don't have generality, if you don't have maintenance, you're not doing a good job, right? Who cares if you teach it in the clinic, they can't go to school and they can't go to home, okay? What if you're teaching someone how to get a job, job skills, and they can't do the job skills at the job? That is a major, major issue. So you can see how these overlap, right? If you're not generalizing, can you really say you're effective? Probably not, okay? Um, you could have chosen socially valid behaviors, right? But you haven't changed anything in a, in a meaningful way, okay? Question, Jason teaches his client how to say their address and phone number. Client masters the skill at 100%. Client later that week gets lost in the store. The security guard asks for the client's phone number, and the client says, I forget. This is an example that lacks what? Well, we taught it, okay? Uh, wherever they, they taught it, right? Jason teaches the client, and he does it with Jason at 100%, okay? But then they go to the store, can't do it, Okay. Are we having behavior that exists in the non-teaching or outside the learning environment? We're not, okay? It is an applied behavior. It's socially valid. Jason's changed it. He has a functional relation. Who knows about technology, right? Maybe, maybe not. We can't say for sure. But we do know it lacks generality. And we can talk for hours on the dimensions, okay? But you want to keep them simple for the exam because you don't want to get them all muddied up, right, um, when answering the questions. So keep it, keep it simple, okay, and, and you can do this. So, as always, behavioranalyststudy.com for study materials. Please subscribe, work hard, study hard, let us know when you pass. See you soon.